Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hey everyone, welcome to this, the RIA Edge podcast. This is a chance for me to talk to founders and executives of registered investment advisory firms that we feel are building businesses designed for sustainable growth and not just rising higher on broader investment market appreciation, or as we have said around here, firms that are growing by design and not by default. Today, I'm speaking to Jonathan Foster. Jonathan is a seasoned financial services executive. He's the former CEO of Howard Capital Management and the former president of Carson Wealth Management. Since 2011, he's been leading his own RIA, Angelus Wealth Management, a firm looking to serve the high net worth and ultra high net worth markets. Jonathan's focused on families who have enough wealth to benefit from family office type services, but not yet at a place where it makes sense to build one for themselves. Angelus Wealth Management has been growing over the past several years at a 40% compound annual growth rate. And that seems only to be accelerating, and we get into that in the conversation. And he's done it without participating in the M&A market. Jonathan recruits solid advisors and finds the best place for them in the organization where their skills can ripple across the broader firm. He's got some interesting takes on outsourcing wealth management services and where he sees the most opportunities going forward. I learned a lot from the conversation, and I think you will too. With that, here's Jonathan Foster. For the people who, uh, well, if you're education, the RAA podcast, RAA Edge podcast is our uh, podcast that we're trying to speak to executives and founders of registered investment advisory firms that really seem to be putting together firms that uh, uh, not just growing on asset appreciation, but are uh, building like professional organizations that are built right. for sustainable growth. You know, and, and what does that look like? What does a sustainably growing RAA look like? Right. What are the constraints? What are the opportunities? How do you go about, you know, balancing uh, getting clients in the door versus resources to serve those clients and you know, how do you make these kind of calculations. So before we begin, do you want to just uh, maybe for the folks who are listening and who don't have an idea, uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, Angelus Wealth Management and give us the one-on-one? Sure. So Angelus Wealth Management is a uh, ultra high net worth private client advisory business uh, and we're about 10 years old and we started with zero clients as employee number one. Today we're approaching two billion of advised assets, all organic, no M&A, no nothing, just all one client at a time. Uh, we're, we're blessed to have a sister company called uh, Angelus Investments, which is a 25-year-old endowment and foundation advisory business, which advises on, a, on about 35 billion of assets for 75 high-profile clients, West Coast, Texas, uh, and some on the East Coast as well. So our value proposition to families is that uh, we're all one process. So anything we build for a billion dollar institution is available to our families at exactly the same term. So at, at Angelus, there's no retail or institutional, we're all one family. So give us then a profile of a, a typical client. Um, from what I understand, your clients are, are maybe just at the family office level, but perhaps not quite there to have their own family office. So what is a typical Angelus client? Right. Well, the, the, the funny term I use to describe it is family office light. So our, you know, our clients are this sort of 10 to $100 million investable asset client and, and have achieved a level of success in life where you know, they're, they're flying net jets or they're flying first class. And a lot of times, when you, upon analysis, their portfolio is flying coach. Mm-hmm. So they tend to need a lot of the services that a family in a multifamily office or single family office would need, but it's not economic for them to pay full freight on that. So by family office light, we, we, when it comes to the investment process, I think we've got that done. And now we, we have a staff that's very experienced around philanthropy advice, wealth transfer strategies, tax, et cetera, that we sort of uh, helicopter that in on top of that because it's not just how much money you make, it's what's your legacy, how much you're going to keep, and thinking about tax and all those things. But unlike some family office shops that have everything internal, we, we use a lot of outside talent. And part of our thoughts are that I'm not sure that the best trust in a state lawyer 
would come work for me. They're probably at one of those fantastic law firms out there, and uh, we would rather access external talent. The same way we're open to architecture and investing, we should be open to architecture and all external services. So that's uh, interesting because I think that flies in the face of what a lot of RIAs are doing and trying to bring all this stuff in-house, right? We hear a lot about RIAs kind of bringing trust services in-house, right. buying or building trust companies uh, to service high net worth clients. You're taking a different approach and thinking that that's probably not the best way to go. Yeah, well, at, yeah, at the moment, there are some things that I have jealousy of other advisors that have. Uh, I'm not sure I want to be in, I don't want to be in the tax prep business. Mm -hmm. I don't think I want to be in the bill pay business. I also don't want to get a call from a client and say, please go pick up my dry cleaning and bring it to the house, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what happens a lot in the family, family office space. Office, sure. And But there are certain things that um, I, I you know, look at greedily that other firms have it. And really, it could be run beefed up uh, estate planning strategies, et cetera. So we have very good people, but there are even better people out there and better solutions. So we're always thinking ahead and where would it make sense for us to round out the offering uh, for the benefit of clients? Because I think what's happening in our space is, I mean, I've been a big uh, um, loud voice about that there's fee compression coming in the space. Mm -hmm. and. As of now, there's been fee compression that's been paid for by the asset management industry. That's right. And we've yeah. avoided it, right? Yeah. So look what the cost of, of index ETFs now, et cetera, has basically gone to zero. Yeah. Even customized indexing is incredibly uh, pricing aggressively now. But our turn may be coming, and uh, if anybody is, if it doesn't come in just lower basis points fees, it's going to be in higher service expectations that are supposed to cost the same thing. So mm -hmm. we'll see. I mean, I think we're pretty lean and mean, and we are. We do not overcharge for what we do. We're pretty aggressive on that. So I think we're in a good spot. There's we'll a couple of ways to yeah. There's a couple of ways to go with that. I, you know, first of all, I'd like to talk about this uh, incredible organic growth rate that you've experienced since you found it. Uh, right. And and particularly in the clients that you serve, that's a difficult nut to crack. Yes. Um, how right. have you done it? What's the well, so the, the first thing that I teach everybody in my organization, because of the nature of clients we're talking to, you can't sell to these people. So I teach them, we tell we don't sell. There'll never be a time at the end of a client meeting, if you're my client and if we had a nice meeting going over your portfolio, I will never say do at the end, and none of my people will say, you know, well, uh, David, uh, so do you like the service you've gotten at Andrews Wealth Management? because I have, a, I have a capacity for a few more clients, and I'd like to know if there's somebody else, uh, one of your friends or family members that I could help as well. I think that's very de classe in this marketplace, because what I've done is I've made you uncomfortable with my client. Mm. That's not, the job here is not that you're supposed to refer clients to me. That's not your, your job. Your job is, is to have your money managed and pay me for services. So I've made you uncomfortable in that situation. So we get lots of referrals from clients, but I think we get it by having the clients come to us. It's the same way if, you're, if you own a Ferrari dealer and someone comes in to buy a Ferrari and you try the hard sell, they'll never buy it. You need to show them the, your capabilities and your, the quality of your process and then they decide to come to you to buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not asking for referrals, is there any kind of marketing strategy? Oh, you, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me back up one step, which is interesting. So there's a great, great quote from William Goldman that says, no one knows anything, yeah. right? And I have said that a lot. I actually didn't even know that William Goldman had said it, so now it, it, it's going to my long honor tradition of plagiarizing every good <laughs> idea I ever made. But, uh, you know, everybody in this industry th thinks they're a genius. I, I think you only learn from failure. You know, the, uh, if, you, if you're a professional tennis player, there's only one winner and there are 63 losers. You better learn something from that process. So uh, I think that you know, my strategy that I've developed around growing the business is, is from constant failure and learning from that and how we do it. What we focused on is, well, first of all, there's so many strategies out there where people are, they're doing lift outs of advisors with books and they're trying to integrate them or they're doing M&A or whatever. One of the beauties of being, being a venture capitalist without capital, <laughs> right, is that in absence of having a large amount of capital to acquire businesses, focus on where the value is. Was the most valuable part of our business is to create organic growth. So it's a great discipline. And so what we've done is we really have a three-pronged approach to growing the business. But before that is to hire good storytellers. So good advisors, but also 
advisors who like talking to people. And when they look at their calendar and they see they have two coffees and a lunch every day this week, that makes them happy, not unhappy. They like talking to people. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we get referral, we, we grow the business in three ways. One is old fashioned referrals mm -hmm. from clients, existing clients, which we do not push for, mm -hmm. but we get plenty of them. The second one is with our relationship with this wonderful endowment and foundation sister company, what you have when you manage money for nonprofits is you have wealthy board members. Mm -hmm. So we get a number of great leads that come over the wall mm -hmm. of people that would like the same, and we have an integrated process, so they would like the same thing that they see their institution getting for their family. And the third part is being out in the community and storytelling. If you go see three people, like I'm seeing four different people today. Okay. If you see, if I see four people today, and I do that all week, that's 20 people this week. That's a thousand people a year that I'm telling what we do, and not ever asking any one of them for an order. It's going to happen mm -hmm. if you have something good to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I also think there's a momentum factor. You know, so in 2017, we had at the end of the year we had a quarter of a billion dollars under manager wealth management. We ended this year. We ended this year at 1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. That ended 2023, and we're growing even faster now. So there's a natural momentum. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's enthusiasm from your employees. Maybe it's enthusiasm from your clients. The first billion is the hardest. Mm -hmm. After that, it starts to get easier. Now the question is, how do you get to be big enough to be significant? And how big is too big? Mm -hmm. I, and I don't know that yet. I'm still working on that. Like I so, said, the, well, give me your thoughts around that though, because uh, you know the the is there a uh, problem, problem, or or a concern with growing too fast. Um, Absolutely, you know, we hear about the uh, talent wars out there. Uh, difficulty finding resources, difficulty finding advisors, difficulty finding right. employees. You know, it, how much? You know, and, and maybe you can just tell me a little bit about what you look for in the business. Maybe there's some metrics that you look at, or just some sensibilities that you you have around. You know, when do we need to kind of build out some infrastructure before we? You know open right. the gates a little bit more for more clients. So I have some pretty radical thoughts around, around this having run a bunch of businesses and, and re reasonably successful businesses, uh, which is um, uh, it's all about culture. Nothing else matters. The last two, th the last probably 50% of the people that I hired, I've had, I had no job for. I did one last week. A young woman who came into for a operations job that she, for which she is not qualified, and I hired her that night. Mm -hmm. So my theory is smart, hungry, intelligent, ethical people will be successful when put in an environment where that, that type of, those type of characteristics are appreciated. My least favorite comments from a potential, uh, from a person applying for a job is, if you want to not get hired by me, in the interview say, what's my job and who do I report to? <laughs> You're out. Because I don't know. You could find me in the copy room binding presentations for clients if somebody else is busy. No job is, to, is, is beneath anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so, it's about, so the hiring is all about culture. And making a culture mistake is a huge problem. And one of the culture mistakes that, that people make a lot in our business is they hire someone who's a rainmaker who's a jerk. Mm -hmm. Not okay. The other mistake that people make is, is uh, signing up clients who are jerks, also not okay. In my organization, any employee can fire any client. And think about that. So an admin person treated badly by a $50 million client can ask me to fire them, and I will. Really? Once they experience me. I mean, matter of fact, in my past, I, have fi I once fired a $100 million client who I was very good friends with, really, but in her life, Everybody was an employee other than the people she felt as a peer like me. But I would see when she'd call the office, I would see the tension and everybody trying to jump high and do what she wanted. And I, and I finally said, you can't stay. I love you. Let's have lunch. Let's have coffee. Let's have dinner. But you're just not treating my staff right. You're making their life miserable. It's not worth it. The, the amount of respect you get from staff when you put their interests ahead of money is incredibly important. Yeah, yeah. How did that client take that news? She keeps keeps asking to come back. It's okay. been a decade. Okay, and we we still have lunch. Yeah, that's great. the The association with the uh, foundation and endowment advisory business. 
brings over some interesting investment opportunities. Uh, and so you do a lot of uh, alternative, what would make lack of a better word, alternative investments for clients. Right. Um, tell me a little bit about your investment process, the strategies that you use, you know, and, and how you're sourcing and finding uh, these alternative investments, whether it's private credit or private equity, whatever it might be, for your clients. Right. Well, let me start with the, di- the initial dialogue with families, because very often there's a reticence around doing alternatives. So let's use private equity as, a, as the big, because that's the biggest bucket. Mm-hmm. And the way I describe, I did this yesterday at a lunch with a prospective client. I said, here's the case for, for private equity versus public equity. If you're sitting at a table and a friend comes to you and says, I want you inv- to invest in my pizza parlor, and I want you to put up money, and you can't get the money out for 10 years, and it might work, it may not. You have the right to expect extremely high rate of return on that investment. So when we look at private investing, we try to underwrite to two or three times the public market rate. And the sellers basically agree with me. Now we're just negotiating what the terms are because it makes logical sense. If you're gonna lock my money up with no chance of liquidity, I have a higher expected return. Mm -hmm. So for people for whom that makes sense, where they can afford the liquidity and also can afford the, the, the painful experience of when, Markets are crashing, I'm calling more of your money now. Mm-hmm. Because the best opportunities come when you really don't want to put money in. Mm-hmm. So that's the basic premise, it's, all, it's just math. Now the question, how do you build it? And I think that we have a really unique advantage because the institutional side of our business has been, because endowments and foundations have been doing private investing forever. Mm-hmm. So we already have a 25 year history of manufacturing, built, uh, manufacturing and curating access to private investments. And what we're able to do on the well side is just sort of piggyback and plug into that. So the, um, I think on private investing, um, you spend half your time trying to find who's good and half your time trying to get a slot because the really good stuff is oversubscribed. Okay. We're not interested in being an investor in ABC giant company fund number 47. Okay. That's not special. Because I don't think you want to risk being lower, the bottom quartile in private investing because then you're in the Roach Motel and you can't get out for 10 years. Yeah. So you want to be in the top two quartiles and that is crowded. So you, how do you get in? Uh, so what we have done, which I think is sort of interesting, is first of all, we created commingled funds where institutions and families can invest pari passu. Mm-hmm. So when we go to, to a capacity constrained opportunity, we just ask for one slot. Mm-hmm. Not asking for 100 slots, you're never gonna get it. Mm-hmm. So we made ourselves an easy guess. And then because of the quality of some of the institutional clients that we have in an environment where private equity fund managers or co-invest opportunities get their pick of LPs and partners, they're going to pick what they think are the best quality LPs, the ones who are the least pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. And so we've tried to make ourselves that, you know, uh, that type of an investor. So we've, uh, we've done private equity, private credit, private real estate, we used to do a hedge fund of funds. We do not put any money in hedge fund and have not for seven years because the returns are not there. The fees are high, the taxes are high, and the returns are not there. You know, we have one group that manufactures and hunts for these things, and we use it together. Now the radical thing that we've done, <laughs> which is you can only do this if you're, if you're your own by, your, your employee-owned business because this idea is so radical, I don't think anyone else is doing it. And it was an idea that came from my head, which is in January 2022, we had just finished you know, done this, doing a series of, of combing the private equity fund of funds. And then we also got a number of co-invest opportunities that did very well. But the talent costs for finding a private equity, retaining those people in your organization, is really high and going up. And you, if, you, if you can't afford to be you know, less than top two quartiles, you really need good talent. So. In the past, if you were a, whether a private client or institutional client, you pay your regular fee for whatever asset class. If you allocate the private equity, or whatever, you're still paying 50 basis points or 25 or 100 or whatever the number might be. So we started something new in, two, in January 2022 on the next vintage of funds. And I didn't know how the clients would respond to it. We said to them, okay, costs are going up. Uh, we kind of have two choices. Do we go to you and say, we need to triple your fee for privates? Or do we do what we're proposing, which is that now when we call capital for private investing, we stop charging a management fee. 
hmm, we just take a performance fee. So that means if you were paying me 50 basis points before as a family, let's say you're a family and you've got $50 million of me, and over time you want to have $10 million into private equity. As I call that capital, that I stop charging that 50 basis points. So for the next three, five, seven, 12 years, I make nothing on you for a chance to be your partner. Hmm. Now that's really expensive to build that to get the harvest period. We didn't know how the clients would react. The reaction was a blowout, absolute blowout. So today, two well, years- Well, it definitely puts yeah. you on the same side, right? I mean, right, so that's the idea about alignment of interest. Be able to say to the client, the only thing, the only thing you know about this, this structure is that there's one rule in our shop, which is try not to do bad deals. <laughs> it's bad for the client, it's bad for us because we're waiving all our management fees for years in order for a chance to earn the right to be a partner. So now, two years later after we started this, we have a billion dollars of committed capital, not all call debt, but to this structure. And we continue to build up the team, whatever, and what we say to our private equity group is, what do you need to be successful? You're done. What do you need to spend? You're done. You don't have to worry about raising money. You're done. It's all internal capital allocated from our clients and all in this format. And we're just starting to get the harvest period on a couple things. We have one IPO that we're still in lockup on, but that's kind of nice. Well, that's great. That's exciting. So, so yeah. these are um, uh, investment opportunities that you find on that side, uh, or your team finds uh, uh, direct, or are they going to uh, general partners uh, and established PE friends out there? In, right. In so our basic th thoughts around private equity is we're looking for small middle market, growth equity, low leverage, capacity constrained strategies. And we're looking for a team that broke off from the big shop and they're in fund now in fund two or three. They do not yet own an NBA team, <laughs> so they're still hungry and they're niche. And also, we also want to be able to either, and we have two different structures, either we have a fund to fund structure where we become LPs to those firms and we have a side by side co-invest fund. Because okay. very often when you're in that group, there could be a great deal that one of these managers sees and they need 150 million in equity, and their limit is 100, and their choice now is either pass on the deal, call in a competitor, which they don't want to do, or go to their favorite LPs and say, would you like to cone mess with us on this, and we'll waive the fees. And so we're a preferred cone best partner for some of these, and we have these funds running side by side. So in a sense, it really lowers the fees to the clients because there's sub-manager fees in the fund of funds. We don't charge a manager fee, just a performance fee on top of that. In the Coinvest fund, there's no sub manager fees, and we don't charge a manager fee, only, only a performance fee. So it's a pretty interesting structure. And the part that I think is reason, one of the reasons I thought of this is how do you retain good people? If it's, if it's all about your people and the quality of the people that you hire, and everybody's trying to hire good people, every person in the organization shares in success of the, of, of the success fees in private equity. So the PE team owns a piece. If you're one of my wealth advisors uh, and you're paid on a grid, so one of the clients has capital call for private equity and the fees go down, so your share of the fees go down, you own a piece of general partnership. You actually know what percentage of the general partnership goes to you. So there's no seeing if John Foster decides to pay you when something happens. You're in the general partnership document mm -hmm. because you're, you are a, you know, you're a partner in that. That's, I don't think anybody else is doing that. Very, very radical approach. But then what happens is that, David, right, who would leave? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Right. right. Who would leave when there's this funnel coming of, 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 of potential success fees? And success fees, hopefully, that your clients are happy to share with you because you've provided outside of the returns and taken all the management fee risk off the table. Yeah. That's interesting. Uh, the, the notion of being, you talk about it being expensive to run, and I'm sure that it is because you're giving up these management fees in the meantime. That's got to be a constraint a little bit on your growth. You know, there's money that you can't use to hire. Uh, there's money you can't use to, right. to build out to whatever else you might need to. Well, so here's another radical thought on that, Dave, which is that I've been doing this for a long time. I don't need the money, right? So if, you, if I take money out of the business, I'm paying 50% in tax. I'd much rather reinvest it in the, the, the future enterprise value of the business and in my people. Mm -hmm. So... For example, last year, I was nowhere near the highest paid person in my firm, and we had record growth. I'm incredibly happy because we're, you know, we're 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 for we're giving up management fees on the private stuff. 
we're paying for the talent cost because all of these people that work in this, they need to pay their bills. They, they're not in the fortune situation I am, which is where I'm okay. So, yeah, and, but before we hit harvest time between the institutional private client side, you know, we're in for millions on this. I think that's pretty cool. I think it's exciting. I'm, I'm, I think it's a good bet. And you can only make that bet if you're, if you're employee owned. You can't make that bet if you're owned by a PE shop because you know, they want to be out in five years. Mm -hmm. This could take 10 or it could take three. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All I know for sure is that nothing's going to go according to plan. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> But we'll see. It could go faster. It could go slower. We could have some stinkers. We could be wrong. I don't think we're wrong. Okay. Uh, I suppose I, this probably would be the time to ask then, where are you finding opportunities in uh, the private credit or private equity space? Uh, you said you uh, low leverage companies, uh, uh, mid market companies. Uh, well, obviously, there's no there's no low leverage in private credit. Right. It's all credit, right? Yeah. And um, you know, private credit is very attractive now, but less attractive for tax paying individuals because everything comes with a fifty percent tax bite. And um, I think that I'm concerned that private credit is a window of opportunity that goes away. Companies that were paying the bank 7% on a resolve, revolver are now paying the private credit industry 12% uh, plus warrants. Mm -hmm. My question would be, maybe I don't want to lend them money right. if they need it that badly. Right. Or maybe they should be selling equity. Yeah. Right. So I think there's a window because all the banks shut down after the last crisis, <laughs> the banking crisis. But I think that corrects itself over time. I think private equity or even venture, which we really don't do a lot of, but I think those are perpetual opportunities. Okay. And, um, and and you know the and the the our, the expected return is so much higher than public equity that if you can afford the liquidity, you should put some money in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Telling the story to clients often of uh, private investments is, is tricky as well. You talk about how you hire storytellers uh, as as part of your process. Obviously, you have to convince them about this lockup period, this ten year lockup period, the illiquidity premium, uh, and explaining that to them. How do you get them comfortable with the actual investments? I mean, is there a, a right? You know, how do you talk to them about? It? Here's another radical mm -hmm. pitch of this. Well, first of all, when I think of storytellers, a great professor is a storyteller, but they they are great storyteller, but they have knowledge. So I think all of our people that tell our story are incredibly talented, knowledgeable, wealth management professionals. Now, you know, getting clients over the, the the feeling of risk is part of explaining. These, these, these returns in our process of how we search for them. What I don't let anybody do is pick. We invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th in Hollywood, Florida for RA Edge, part of the Wealth Management Edge event. With an agenda designed to help accelerate the growth of your RAA firm with the latest C-suite strategies, you'll walk away with frameworks and approaches for M&A, organic growth and talent development. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% on your registration. Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. So there are lots of platforms out there or advisors out there that are trying to create a platform of opportunities and the clients get, get to pick mm -hmm. what they want to go into. Mm -hmm. Going back to the William Goldman quote that no one knows anything, mm -hmm. we have incredibly successful bright, talented clients who know nothing about investing because this is a full-time job. So if they commit to private investing with us, they commit to a dollar percentage and they don't get to pick and choose. It's blind. Oh, well, okay. Right? So if you're my client and you've decided and you've, and I've, we've talked this through and we've modeled it out and you've decided that over a period of time you would like 15% of your, of your, um, of your risk capital exposure mm -hmm. to be in privates and the rest in publics. Mm -hmm. You commit to funds in a dollar amount or percentage, and then I tell you what you bought. Okay. Because if I ask you, you're gonna do the wrong thing at the wrong time, right? right? right. So you'll, because all information that you have from the press from the public is a day late and a dollar short. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's being, being a bit of a contrarian still always makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and short term, right? Short term thinking. And right, I mean, you know, I, there's, a, there's a famous quote about a client asks an advisor, my portfolio, is so, my portfolio is so volatile, how do I make it less volatile? And the answer is, well, only open your statement once a year. Right? All this noise, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, like, it, everybody's focused on what is the Fed going to say today? 
it doesn't matter. The question is, do you believe in 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 the long term the long term deployment of intelligent deployment of capital will work? Mm -hmm. A dollar put in the U.S. stock market two hundred years ago and reinvested is worth sixteen million dollars today. Yeah. The rest is noise. Now, if you're in privates versus publics and that compounding rate is higher, the number is astronomical. If you say I'm going to be in bonds. You basically get inflation protection. That's about it. You know, risk pays off over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. the, the problem that a lot of investors have with private investing is the, their experience is cousin Johnny with the pizza parlor mm -hmm. or something they did on their own. This is a process. So the when you're in our fund fund to fund structures, we've 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 done thousands of meetings to pick and know these people. We have 40,000 meeting notes on file from talking to managers. So we kind of know everybody at this point. And, and we're a prized LP, not because necessarily the private wealth side, because but the institutional side. So I tell every asset manager who calls me and says, I'd like an introduction. I said, well, okay, yeah, great, bring the A game. You probably will not succeed. But if you do, it's like winning the lotto, right? Because we're very committed and we're very loyal if you do what you say you're going to do and you pass the test. Mm -hmm. And it's a big test. Mm -hmm. So it's a process to this. And even on the co-invest side, which is interesting, so on the co-invest side, we're being showed investment opportunities from firms that we think are so good that we're their LPs. We've already given them substantial capital. And we still pass on those co-invest opportunities 90, 95% of the time. Hmm. Because it's, a, it's, about, it's about selection. It's about avoiding mistakes. If you're not sure, the answer is no. Wait for the next one. Mm -hmm. Because there's only one rule. Don't do bad deals, right? <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because you know the type of the reason that uh, private equity and alternative investments uh, are growing, I think, in popularity or at least seen as an opportunity uh, for financial advisors is because the class of public equities has shrunk. Right. Uh, there's not as much diversity in there. There's not as right. much non-correlation. It's all kind of the same mm -hmm. thing. Is that? Do you find that resonates with your thinking as well? Uh, just the, the the shrinking opportunities in the public. Side. Well, and I would say it's, David, it's even more than that, which is that going back to my earlier experience in the business, where we used to do equity research, yeah. you know, I'd write, we'd write research and research reports and buy stocks. PE ratio, that was a... Yeah. Someone, right, someone asked me now what I think about Apple or NVIDIA, I'm going to break out in highs. I can't talk about stocks. Yeah. I can talk about allocation. Mm -hmm. And... And when it comes to allocating around public equities, which we, public equity, public debt, we do that a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, that we'll ever again hire a U.S. large cap active growth manager with 100% turnover charging 75 basis points who has a good record. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to pay them for last year's good factor bets. Mm -hmm. We'd rather control the factor bets ourselves. I'd rather give me an index fund that's tax efficient, super cheap, and does what it's sold. Mm -hmm. Because... Because there's plenty of value to be created in asset allocation. That's 95% of the value. Mm -hmm. So the asset management industry is a race to zero on costs, but, and, but around efficiency. Yeah. Who would buy a mutual fund anymore when there's an ETF for everything? Because yeah. every year in mutual funds in November, December, you get a surprise tax bill. Mm -hmm. That's the money I can't get back. You give me a tax bill in December, I have no time to wiggle. Yeah. <laughs> I have no time to get out of it. Right, right. All of our clients are in the highest tax bracket. So... There's been a tremendous change in public markets, just going back to answering your question, which is that um, picking stocks is an antiquated concept. Uh, picking strategies, endowment style, which is, you know, which is our basic uh, strategy, is, I think, really think the way to go. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not going to change. You know, I think that if you try to pick the right tech stock, and you pick the wrong one. Oops. Yeah. My my father's best friend growing up was an EVP of Polaroid. Now it's zero. Everybody's got a story about their their cousin who bought Apple, but they mm -hmm. don't tell you the one about the one who bought Eastman Kodak. Right. right. Yeah, it's true. Uh, everybody's a genius. It's like Las Vegas, you know. Nobody nobody loses. Everyone right. kind of. Everybody's above yeah. average. Right. 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 <laughs> um, so that's fascinating on the investment side, and thank you for that. The um, you were talking about like other service that you provide for the families that you serve. Uh, also, seems to be a kind of a resource-heavy lift. Yes, you know, so, I mean if uh, you know we're talking about uh, high net worth or ultra high net worth clients who are just kind of bumping up against the family office, 
position anyway. Like you say, I mean, we don't want to do the picking up the laundry and, and renting the jet to Mykonos or whatever it is. Right. But, uh, I'd like to go on the jet to Mykonos, <laughs> but I don't want to have to range for it. <laughs> uh, but what, what are, uh, you know, in terms of like other services beyond investment right. advice uh, and, and portfolio management do you provide? So the most valuable one, I think, is discussions around legacy. You know, so we're in an environment where, unfortunately, 50% of Americans can't find 500 or 1,000 bucks for a crisis. And for 95% of the country, the one pressing concern is, will I outlive my money? And that's brutal. So for that 5% or so who's cleared that threshold, which is really our clients, the next question is, well, what's it all about, Alfie? Right? I mean, what's, what's your legacy? You know, it's more than that you've solved that problem. Is it to be the richest person in the graveyard? Is it to bounce a check to the undertaker? Or is it about, or is it about creating a legacy for your children, your community, or the things you care about? So planning, sort of wealth strategy planning for wealthy people starts with conversation. And it has to start with honest conversation. I would say without question, I have yet to talk to a wealthy, successful family, the patriarch or matriarch, who hasn't made significant boo-boos in their planning or how they're dealing with their family or tax or whatever. So let's start with a conversation, which is, what are you trying to do? And no one wants to talk about their mortality. But it, let's figure out what you want to do, and then let's help you construct what you need. And, uh, um, and the simplest thing could be you know, having an up-to-date will and trust, which is shocking to people that don't have that. I did it. I did uh, an article for, for another news publication, and, and I, I fall on, fell on my own sword in this for my family, which is that uh, my sister, who was the smartest person that I ever knew, who unfortunately died a few years ago, she was a trust and estate law professor, Yale and Stanford graduate. She taught defective wills and trusts as a tenured professor at Wash U forever. She retired and then died of cancer and died in test state. Mm. She had a lovely, beautiful handwritten will, but she forgot a bunch of things, and luckily her, her, you know, her her husband and I are very good friends. But we still were, went through California probate for a year and a half, mm. and because she forgot things, smartest person I know in this space. If you wanted to talk about James Gandolfini's defective will mm. or lack of will, she could tell you about it. Mm. But she made mistakes herself, so everybody makes mistakes, and sometimes they make mistakes because they haven't changed things. I have one. One client who, when I looked at his will, his ex-girlfriend from 20 years ago was his executor. <laughs> this is not a good thing. Right. Or another person whose ex-husband was her beneficiary. This happens all the time. So let, let's start with what is the legacy you're creating, and then let's do the blocking and tackling to figure out how to get there. The most interesting thing is around, giving, is around philanthropy, because there's... You know, a lot of times when you have a wealthy family, they don't only get along. You know, more money, more problems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times if you have a first-generation wealth creator family, there's a, higher, there's a higher tendency that family relationships are strained because mom or dad was at work. They weren't home. And that, you can feel that in the room when you talk mm -hmm. to the family. So there's nothing that can do more to bring a family together or tear it apart than giving away money. So family philanthropy done correctly is a really good tool to, to bring everybody back together and damage some relationships. But you have to keep an open mind. What happens a lot is when you start, we start in this process, and I think most of your people listening to this have experienced this. If there's a family foundation or even could be a family that don't advise fund or something, and you get mom and dad to say, okay, uh, Sally and Joe are 20 something year old kids who want you to start to be involved in, in giving in the family philanthropy so go find some things that you want to give money to and Sally comes back and says I care about the environment and Joe says I care about LGBTQ issues and mom and dad say don't be a schmuck we care about cancer hmm. so, oh no you just you just blew it right you just drew them up, drove them apart again so that's a really good tool not only to help your leg your 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 philanthropic legacy, but your half your family legacy. So there are all these tools that you can use. It's not just your defective grantor trusts mm -hmm. and grats and gruts and cruts and all this stuff. It's it starts with a conversation. And so the people on your staff, the wealth managers on your staff, uh, have some training in oh, yeah. how to hold these kinds of conversations yeah. with families, and and they also know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. 
So you know when it's time out, and if you call in the fantastic group of trust and estate lawyers that we all know in every major city around America. But a lot of times, if a lot of times families don't know what they want to talk about, and they hesitate to go and to speak to a trust and estate lawyer at fifteen hundred dollars an hour, and wander through ideas. Mm -hmm. So wander through the ideas with us, and we'll go with you together, and say, here's the notes I took. Like I've had trust estate lawyers, and I go in there with the old the old will, and I've dog-eared the pages, and they come up and they thank me because they don't want to spend all, all this time and give somebody a gigantic bill that people complain about. They they want to be efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we're could be a real help in that. And the other rule I have when dealing with other professionals, absolutely absolutely no quid pro quo. I'm not giving you a referral because I'm expecting one back. The biggest case I ever referred on estate planning, which was, which was probably a $5 million in billings to, to a state plan firm in, 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 in Los Angeles. They did a fantastic job. They've never sent me a client. I will send them more. Because hmm. it can't, you can't leverage your clients for your own benefit. It, this has to be fidu all fiduciary activity. Mm -hmm. as, as, as it sounds like that's a theme that runs throughout uh, your organization, right? So don't leverage them for referrals. Don't leverage them for right. uh, you know extra business on the on the, the COI side. Or and I think that's I think that's a basic characteristic of our industry. You know, if 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 the only rule, if there's only one rule, right, which is that the client's interests come first. I mean, the brokerage entity freaks out about that. They're trying to fight it every way they can. They want to know how close they can get to the edge and it's okay mm -hmm. to make it suitable. Our rule is simple. And you're basic, when you get an, if you get an SEC audit, they're gonna check for that. So you be an honest person, be someone who think, put your client's interest first. We're a very well-paid profession, right? We're, but you know, uh, we'll do fine, right? But uh, our, you know, we will not be as wealthy as our clients. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we're, we're pushing up against the end here, but I did want to ask you, uh, in, this has been all organic growth that you've experienced so far, no right. M&A. Uh, right. Is M&A anything that you would look at in the future? Is there an opportunity for it for you on uh, the trajectory that you see for your firm? I, you know, my phone rings constantly, uh, and I happy to talk to everybody about what we're doing. And there, there's, there's always a shortage of good ideas. So... I think that the, um, uh, you know, I, I think our, our culture should be the survivor, but, you know, there could be a, another advisory group out there that hasn't solved access to alternatives and likes the, the way we structure it and they'd like to come join us. That'd be great. I'm, I'm not a, opposed to it. Uh, what I'm opposed to is something where, you know, where our culture gets lost and people don't want to work here anymore. Because, as I said before, I'm lucky in that I don't need the money. I mean, I like making money. I'm a capitalist. But I'm, if I get hit by a bus on the way out the door, everybody in my life is fine mm. after working for almost 40 years, right? So, um, and I, I, but I spent a lot of time thinking about the other people. So how do you, you know, if you sell to somebody else, what's the, what's the shot clock look like? So many of these private equity firms, for example, they have a three or five year shot clock. Mm -hmm. I think there's other things developing over time which are where there is no shot clock. They're trying to build perpetual organizations. We shall see. But I, but I do think this industry is going to get bigger. So for me right now, in our, I mean, our institutional side is a, is a very good size. But if we're approaching you know, two billion in assets on the private wealth side, it's a nice little business. It used to be a big business, not anymore. But you know, how do we get to five billion? How do we get the five billion with the same culture, the same type of clients? That's what I spend my time thinking about. I think it's really about the talent and a little bit about performance, but but it's about good, high quality solutions and and making a place where people want to work and stay. Mm -hmm. So I'm not against things. I you know, I'm happily talk to everybody. I tell everybody, you know, I just told you our private equity secret. Mm -hmm. It's no secret. If you as a firm want to go out and you want to invest. Five ten million dollars to build this out. Be my guest. Go yeah. for it. I think it's great. Yeah, yeah. join the party. And uh, needless to say, but you won't be on the receiving end of that private equity. You're not looking to raise capital for your firm. No, no. It's I said there's there's a great I said there's a great discipline, and I said being the venture capitalist on capital, right? Because it, but sometimes it makes you too conservative, right? So 
I can make a half a million dollar mistake, a hiring mistake or wherever it might be. I can't make a five million dollar mistake. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good thing. But uh, yeah, but but the other side of that, there could be opportunities that come along, and there have been a couple that come along that were great people that I that that I wanted to have come with us, but I couldn't get them because something else was more attractive. One team I could think of I want to talk about, but I was very sad they went somewhere else. Uh, but they made the right decision because what they needed was a, that full range of services that we just talked about. So mm -hmm. I had some jealousy around some of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that will take some money to build that out. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. So, like I said, no one knows anything. Yeah. So we'll see what the future holds. What about the um, just in, in broader? Uh, you know, you have written about and talked about the broader trends in the RA industry, uh, and it sounds like some of what concerns you there is the. Uh, uh, the short-term capital that's funding a lot of the RAs out there, uh, and perhaps the uh, you know the fact that the most advisory firms have, have wafted up on this market appreciation for a decade plus, uh, and perhaps that hides a lot of sins. Uh, and when that tide washes out again, as it inevitably will, yes, right. I mean, we'll see a pullback in equity markets at some point. I think people have been talking about it forever. It doesn't seem to be happening, but it's got to happen at some point. Uh, you know, does that uh, leave a lot of firms exposed? Well, I think the you know the the sell-offs in markets depends on your lens, right? I mean, I can remember as a young man, my first job on Wall Street, watching in amazement as the Dow crossed a thousand. Mm -hmm. That's how old I am, right? So, I mean, add and make put in dividends, reinvested in the Dow Jones average, and it's at probably fifty thousand with dividends reinvested. So a lot of it is your lens, like you know the you know the great crashes of twenty nine or you know, other time period, 87, you could be, they're like a blip now when you look long term. Mm -hmm. So, and if you're dealing with families of great wealth, it, done right, they're multi-generational investors. That, that thing about a dollar turning into 16 million over 200 years. We have families that had money 200 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It, so, and, and they also have families where it's you know, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, right? So. Um, it depends on your lens on things. I think what's interesting is that there's a lot of um, financial engineering going on in this. You know, I saw a, uh, a roll-up business that was actually shown to us on the private equity side. We're buying uh, firms at an 8 multiple. We want you to invest at a 15 multiple, but we'll sell at a 22 multiple. My, my question is, why? Mm -hmm. If you have a, like, if you have a, a firm that's run by same people for 20 years and they've gotten it up to a 400 million dollar practice and every year they grow about the speed of the market what makes you think once you buy them they're going to grow at twice the speed they're not they're a seller so these you know the, if you haven't want to have a successful roll up who are you rolling up if you're rolling you can't you know, two dogs don't make a cat mm -hmm. so and that's okay because this is a business that has attracted high quality practitioners who are ethical, who have nice small businesses like lawyers. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't tell me that they, used, they grew at 8% a year, which is basically market, and suddenly now they're, worth, they're gonna grow twice as fast. It's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So, there are, and then a lot of these strategies are done with leverage and debt. Show me a strategy that's debt free, where businesses grow, right? We've grown, <laughs> Right in that last some from 2013 till now, we've grown almost 7x with no money. Right, we started this with the with the with our own bucks. Right, every nickel that we put in, we put into hiring something or whatever is money we didn't take. Mm -hmm. And you know, so there are people that know how to grow. You look at there, there are people that are great at rolling business, running businesses. I was president of Carson Wealth Management mm -hmm. before this. Ron knows how to grow. Yeah, how to how to grow business. Mm -hmm. Right, those are the things that you should back. The the rolling up of uh, low growth, uh, you know, unexciting businesses is okay if you're okay with one big, large, unexciting, slow growth business. That's mm -hmm. okay too. Mm -hmm. It, it doesn't seem to have worked out for a lot of firms. Yes, I mean, we've seen some, recently, some things kind of fall apart. I mean, There's been no public company yet yes, that's worked. Exactly, yes. Although there I, have been attempts, right? I mean, there have been people who have tried. Right, and um, I, uh, uh, I listened to Mark Hurley speak a week ago. So he yeah. had a fascinating take on it. He's always very provocative. Mm -hmm. And 
I asked him this question. I said, um, he said, no public companies will work. They never will. Hmm. And I said, that can't be the case. It's got to, and, and I said, well, what's, so what's the exit going to be for these giant private equity firms? Like, once they get to be so big, there's no bigger private equity firm to take their piece. He said, they sell to their LPs because they have sovereign wealth funds that are in, and mm -hmm. this is, or, you know, huge family offices who, who basically want to buy stuff and not sell it. So that's kind of a brilliant thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the answer. Like, does, does the Walton family end up owning a giant RA business? Right. And these really, really wealthy families or sovereign wealth funds, the worst thing for them is when a PE firm gives them their money back. Mm -hmm. One, they have to pay fees, but then two, now what are they going to do with it and have to pay tax? So maybe maybe he's right. That's an interesting thing. But somewhere these big PE rollups, you know, where does it go? You know, if, you, if you've if some of them are getting pretty big. Yeah, that's interesting. And you know, the public market is the public market is saying to you, don't come to us because you're going to have reverse you're going to have reverse arbitrage. Right. Your business is worth a 20 multiple when you're private and now you're worth an 8 multiple in the public market because we're so quarterly earnings focused that long-term investments in growing what is a long-term multi-generational business doesn't work seem to work in the public market. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody will figure it out. We'll see. It's interesting. Yeah. Story not written yet. Story yeah, not written. I, I, this has been great. I know. I've, I've kept you too long and I think we've, we've Fun. pushed up against our our time limit here, they'll tell me to cut this down somehow. <laughs> uh, John, thanks very much for joining us. I appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Thank you. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.